let's talk about the use of barbed wire in the First World War. Now, I'm sure we're all well aware what barbed wire actually is, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's cover that first. Effectively, you just have a string of wire, this will serve us for now, I'm sure. Uh, you have a long string of wire, and every six inches or so, you have another piece of sharpened wire wrapped around it. So, effectively, you can have a whole string of just barbed points sticking out. Now, while it was patented first by an American uh, farmer in the 1874, I believe it was, basically as a just a more efficient way to keep cattle from plowing through the fence without, you know, at least having something to stop them, uh, it was rapidly adopted for military use. We see extremely limited use in uh, the American Civil War, and obviously that's not what the, the, the patented version, so to say, just early, more rudimentary forms. Uh, as well, during the Franco-Prussian War, we see limited use, but it came into its primary use in the, at the, around the turn of the century in the Second Boer War, when the British used it to effectively fence off entire sections of the Veld, which is the South African countryside, uh, trying to capture these roving bands of soldiers, uh, commandos. We'll, we'll talk more about those at a later time, but for now we're just focusing on barbed wire. But of course, and this is the topic of today's video, it really came to its prime as a tool of warfare, most infamously in the First World War. But, to be entirely honest, you know, I'd always read in the, in the books and in these accounts of, of the soldiers, you know, how, the, how wire was such a massive problem for them, and how if you're trying to advance across a field, you know, you run into wire, and that could stop an entire unit from advancing. That could, you know, kill off an entire assault. It could destroy an army. Barbed wire. But how? I mean, look at it. It doesn't just... Surely, at least this is what I had always thought previously, just step over it. It's, I mean, it's just a little string. I mean, yes, it's a nuisance, say, for a cow trying to go over a fence, or if you're trying to sneak into somebody's rose garden or something, it could pinprick you and it can snag on your clothing. Oh, just a, a, you know, a real nuisance. But stopping a dedicated army from attacking their opponent, it always seemed something like more of a, you know, just sort of a nuisance to slow them down and, you know, maybe allow for times for, for the real weapons, you know, the machine gunners and the landmines and artillery to do the real damage to an enemy force. How can just a, a string of, of, you know, loose wire with the occasional spike sticking out of it really do anything at all to an army? You see, barbed wire, as used in warfare, doesn't look like you say, say the usual way that we may see barbed wire, say on the top of a prison gate, or even, you know, just if you're in the countryside, along a fence post to keep animals penned in. It was far darker than that. See, you wouldn't just have a simple little string of it along the ground as sort of like, oh hey, you better watch your step on the field. See, it wouldn't look like this. It would look a lot more like this. An advancing force wouldn't just come across, as you say, as you see perhaps in that photograph from the Somme of soldiers, you know, stepping over the wire as they're advancing. Now, it may look like that, yes, closer to an individual's trench, closer to a lane of attack that you know your own men are having to be moving through on a, say, a regular basis, or at least that they will be moving through and through in the future. It wouldn't look like that when used in a defensive capacity. It wouldn't just be that simplistic, you know, a few little strings of it on the ground that, yes, now, you know, sure, if the men are standing up and they're having to, you know, climb over the wire, it's sort of, it's, it's, it is a nuisance, it slows them down, certainly, and it does provide a bigger target for, again, the way I always saw it, it provides a bigger topic, target, not topic, target, for the machine gunners to, and, and the riflemen opposite to pick you off as you're trying to weave your way through this, you know, all the muck on the ground and the wire. It might also trip someone, you know. It can be useful in that way. But, again, this is the way that I used to see it. No, no, the way that barbed wire would be deployed was not a single string on the ground. It, it would be more like a mesh, more like a, like, like a hedgerow of this, of this mess of, these, of this wire, that rather than a force coming up to it and then having to climb over it one by one, it's just you meet it and, you know, uh, you can't go through. As in, it's imagine if you will, and this is sort of the best way to describe it, I suppose, imagine you're trying to get into someone's yard. I don't know why you're trying to get into, don't, don't trespass. But if you're trying to get into someone's yard and there's a bush, say, about shoulder high meeting you, well now, it's 
possible, sure, to just walk through it, because it's, I mean, it's just a bush. You may get some scrapes and some bruises and everything from branches, but you can eventually hack your way through that thing, or crawl your way through it. You can maneuver your way through it. But now imagine all of the leaves on it are like, are like thorns on a rosebud, or, or razor blades, or little pieces of paper that, as you go through, are giving you paper cuts the entire time. It was only after I, again, realized that, that you can begin to see how an entire assault can be slogged down, or even just stopped in its tracks, by these massive rows of dense, uh, mesh-like barbed wire being deployed on the field. Now, of course, there are ways around the barbed wire, uh, and in fact, they were, I mean, the men were obviously trained to get through it. The first and the most obvious example, I think, are wire cutters, and the existence of wire cutters, I think, helps to reinforce this idea in my mind that the barbed wire would just be sort of like a single little string running along, and you, you know, like, maybe it's rather thick, but you have to, you know, have someone come over, cut, 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 and then they can all go through. It's, the books never really gave me a, a proper understanding, I suppose, because they never actually showed it how complex of a project that may have been. Rather than just having one guy with a pair of wire cutters, though, you need a team of people with cutters, sappers in a way, to try and clear a path through these things. And when you realize as well that it wasn't just little groups of men moving around, you know, it wasn't just like, say, German stormtroopers trying to, you know, sneak into the other guy's line, but you'd have entire massive fronts trying to push their way through, you can begin to see just how much it can slow these teams down, if the wire cutters are even able to get through. Now, that being said, why the, the method of just sending, you know, men with the soldiers to try and clear a path as they're advancing through this, you know, thick brush of wire, that's more of, a, uh, of an in-the-field, ad-hoc solution to the problem. Now, usually what they would be trying to do to clear away this wire before a major assault is the use of artillery. Now, of course, heavy artillery is, you know, it, it's the... The First World War is one of the first times that the European continent truly sees the awesome power of artillery. Of course, we have things like shell shock really becoming, uh, coming to the forefront at this time. And it was used as an attempt to, again, clear paths for infantry uh, to carry on their assault. In fact, oftentimes the infantry would be assaulting so close behind the artillery, and they'd have the artillery rolling, it's called a rolling barrage, following in front of them, so that way the enemy is always distracted, so to say, you know, you can't exactly pop out your head to fight back because there's artillery falling on you right before the infantry strikes. So, that was off track. Uh, so, so the idea is using artillery to, again, sort of clear the path, clear the way of the wire. Of, you know, if you have that sort of, like, hedgerow of barbed wire, you can hit it with enough explosive shells that it'll loosen it up, it'll loosen a path, and the men can maybe more easily then weave their way through it and step over, you know, carrying the rifles, like, up, like, nice and high up and trying to get through. But what would usually happen, rather than the artillery just, you know, opening up, clearing a nice path through which the infantry could cleanly, clearly advance and keep their formation, all these nice things, uh, imagine, if you will, to add a piece of steel wool, and then I blow it up with a firework. Is the steel wool just going to split nicely and have a nice little log? You can walk right through it. No, moreover, it's going to, it's certainly going to disturb the form of the steel wool, but really it's just going to make it more of a mess. So rather than the wire, the, the artillery hitting the wire and splitting it open and causing these nice clean paths so you can walk through, well now you just have a shell hole, you have a crater now, and it's filled with even, with, with the same amount of barbed wire that you still have to get through, and it's all messed up. It's not, you know, lined nice and neatly, that maybe there's a semblance of, hey, we can, you know, cut, 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 open it up and go through, go through, no matter how slow that may be. It's just a tangled mess now. It's even closer to that hedge example that I used earlier. And now, of course, later on in the war, we have a new development that offers perhaps a different way of dealing with the wire, of clearing through a much cleaner path uh, through the wire, that, you know, more uh, solid units of infantry can, as a group, actually move through in a timely and a speedy fashion. And that is the development of the tank. Now, like, you know, sure, you have, oh, you have your, you know, pitiful little, you know, hedgerows of wire over there. Yes, but we have this multi-ton steel behemoth that's just going to plow right over it. I mean, these things, you know, we've all seen them go over the trenches and just plow through the mud. And, I mean, sure, they broke down all the time, but 
for what was around at the time, these would be terrifying monstrosities of a new industrial kind of military. And surely they could just plow right through this, you know, bit of wire. Now sure, perhaps for the first few uh, rows that it met, yeah, it would just go right on through, and the infantry could follow up, you know, right behind and ready to get the Hun. But what happens when it hits another one? And another one, and another one, and we have already the idea that these tanks are not the most reliable in terms of their mechanics, they would actually get stopped up by wire. And we, ha we actually have numerous photographs of how these things would just collect wire on them, and how it would slowly but surely just slog them and slow them down. So thick was the wire that even a tank couldn't actually push their way completely through or just, you know, snap it off. The stuff wasn't weak. It, it, was, it was originally designed to keep cows behind a fence. I mean, with those little thin little strings, it meant to keep a cow behind. It's not like the tank is just going to snap it in two in a nice clean fashion. So even a tank isn't really a foolproof way, a, a clean way of getting through this mesh. And of course, heavy industrial equipment aside, for the average foot slogger, what option, if you come across this great wall of wire, what options do you really have available to you? Now, of course, we discussed things like the wire cutters and the uh, and sappers earlier on, who perhaps, you know, they can tunnel underneath and plant explosives and try and blast away through before the battle. It happened numerous times. But again, you have the same thing with the artillery. Now you just have a pit with messed up barbed wire in it that you still have to get over somehow. Oftentimes, the, the best paths that were available to these soldiers would be take a plank of wood, I suppose, put it over top, and, and you know, try and somehow balance your way over the top of uh, this mesh of wire. As the enemy is shooting at you, as the ground is shaking with all these the mortar shells and everything landing around you, uh, hopefully you're not having to wear a gas mask while you're doing all this. And, of course, the the stress of knowing that if you fall, hey, guess what? Remember the uh, the rose bu the rose bush of of paper cuts that we were describing earlier. It's 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 a rather stressful position to be in, uh, I should imagine. And of course, if you happen to lack a piece of wood to get over the top, well, uh, sorry Jenkins, lay down, get on the wire because that might be your only path forward. Laying down anything you can get, even perhaps you know one of your guys or more preferably, I suppose, a corpse to try and get over the top. Otherwise, you know, go back to your own trench because you're not getting anywhere. Of all of the things that affected the mind of the soldier on the battlefield of the First World War, barbed wire is one of the most distinctive. It's one of the most... It's one of the things that stands out the most. We can see it in their artwork, in, in their songs. I, uh, the old... The, the, the song comes to mind hanging on the old barbed wire, which details, you know, a company of soldiers singing about every single rank uh, within the military. If you want to find the general, we know where, where we know where he is, we know where he is. He's pinning another medal on his chest. If you want to find the sergeant, I know where he is, I know where he is. He's, he's drinking all the company rum. If you want to find the old battalion, we know where they are, we know where they are. If you want to find the old battalion, we know where they are. They're hanging on the old barbed wire. It was almost... No, no, in fact, not almost. It was. It was oppressive, the presence of this stuff. Everywhere that you look, even behind the lines, it just because it, it just becomes one of those, you know, day-to-day -day things. Just like the smell of, of just bodies that hangs and, limers, and lingers in the air. Everywhere you step, there will be just wire on the ground. It's just a constant grim reminder that the entire world around you is just, it's just fenced in, is blocked in with this deadly material. I imagine that just, you know, living in one of those trenches, it must have felt like you were in a prison cell, oftentimes. And you can really see that, I think, in some of the artwork and the writings that these men would, you know, create upon returning back from the war, if they were so fortunate. So, if I suppose I was going to try and come up with a conclusion to this video, as you know, I'm always uh, not very good at these sorts of things, I suppose it would be, hmm, you know, big surprise, barbed wire. Not very fun. of engaging the enemy in melee combat.